else. The child is, goes to the teacher who will guide that child. mean by external moral authority? You use that expression a lot. Materialism has to do with when you are... Hello, it's fabulous to have all of you back in the studio with us for the course in Values and Spirituality. Today we will be taking up the subject of strategies for improving personal relationships. We will also be looking at uh, two aspects of spirituality which Sister Denise will take up. Sister Denise, I would like to welcome you into the studio today. Thank you very much. You start off by saying, people around you with their unique personalities, idiosyncrasies and character defects will certainly be a challenge. People around you also are faced with your idiosyncrasies and your character defects. Um, what does that mean as far as one's spiritual progress is concerned? I think what happens to a lot of people is you position yourself in the center of the universe and you think that, well, I'm normal, I'm a good person, I'm virtuous. And then from that, that position, you engage with the world and there are some people that you like, some people you're impressed with, other people irritate you. And anyone who elicits a negative emotion in you or that you find them intolerable or wrong or something like this, your feeling goes into your intelligence and your intelligence says, well, they feel wrong, so they are wrong. And I'm right, you see. Now, what spirituality says is that this is really ego. And what we have to do is be able to move ourselves out of the center of the universe to one side and just see how the machinery of social life happens. Every so often you do come into center stage, but you don't stay there all the time. You move around, different other people come center stage. And what we have to do is harmonize with other people because um, each and every one of us is a little bit good and a little bit bad. And we each bring different virtues, different qualities, different characteristics to the, the drama that is being played out. And, um, you know, I use the word idiosyncrasies because it refers to the specifics of an individual and it doesn't really um, identify them as good or bad, but they're just particularities of that person. Another person will think that's bad or they'll get impressed and they'll say, that's good. But idiosyncrasy is a much more um, neutral word. So you have to deal with this. And what you don't have ordinarily, because of spiritual depletion, is you do not have the power to manage other people's characteristics uh, because it requires power and you don't even realize that it requires power, so you just assume that I'm fine and everybody else is not. Then, of course, you don't have good relationships, or um, you get classified as immature, which mm. you are. Mm. You haven't developed, you haven't grown, you haven't acquired these things. I don't think your normal education helps you with that. A person who lives in a family or g attends a school, which it does help you with that, is very rare and very fortunate. But most people don't get that. You go on to say, you need to be able to hold your own and maintain your self-respect, values and spiritual qualities, particularly in the face of provocation and obstacles. It is short-sighted to wish for ideal conditions because they limit your development. I smiled when I read the last line because most of us spend most of our lives wishing this person was different, my circumstances were different, my finances were different, etc. 
We, yes. um, we all display those qualities. Uh, could you take us through what you mean by both of those lines? And I'm particularly interested in what your definition is of holding your own. A lot of it has to do with keeping yourself inwardly directed because then you are in your own world and from there you go out into the social world. When you are disconnected from your inner space, your inner world, and you're out there, you're all the time reacting to things, so you don't have a, a kind of base place from which to operate. And I think it's really good to keep going to this, what's sometimes been called the ground of being. Uh, that's a new term to me. What does that mean? Well, it's the, the foundation of your spirit. It's the place where you go back to and from where you extend yourself out into the social world, the intimate world, the professional world, the natural world. This is like home for you. Everyone has a home. Everyone has a home, not a house, but this inner space. Mm. Okay. So you um, are dealing with um, different obstacles. It's a world where everyone is pretty much spiritually depleted. And if you are having your act together and you can look after yourself, one of the things that happens is other, other people see you as a source of energy and they may, you know, glom on to you and try and use you instead of sustaining themselves with their own spiritual source. And what that means is you have to create boundaries. And when we go into, I think it's module seven, we really talk about boundaries, but it's good to um, be aware of the importance of creating boundaries so that who you let in and where you create a barrier is up to you and you have a right to do that. Because you're not just, you know, free food for anybody to come and eat you up. Um, there are many obstacles. Somebody may not like the way you are and want you to be some other way. And you have to be able to maintain yourself, sustain yourself and your right to be who you are. And this is a form of assertiveness. Some people may accuse you of being aggressive, but it's actually not aggressive, it's assertive. And I've often heard it say that to be assertive is the same thing as to have self-respect. So that's an mm. interesting a synonym. Yeah, I, that, with that I would agree with you. You go on to say, the development and cultivation of values and spiritual pr practice take place best in conditions of adversity. As we know from uh, the famous phrase, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Um, one winces when one reads this line because um, adversity is not something that any human being ordinarily looks forward to. It's something that we get thrown into and you either sink or swim. Well, that's right. So this is really a, an aspect of the course which, um, which is a bit tough. Um, this isn't easy. Uh, a lot of people think it should be easy. Maybe it should be easy, but it isn't. And so we have to be realistic. And when we are facing difficulties, uh, we should not just fall apart at the first difficulty, but we have to actually learn to use adversities and difficulties to strengthen oneself and make oneself experienced. The problem is when someone encounters these kinds of adversities when they're very young, that throws them into survival because they are absolutely not equipped to deal with it. And going into survival as a child creates character defects and damages their ability to grow emotionally, socially, spiritually. Consequently, there's a lot of repair work that has to happen. 
So when we engage on a course in values and spirituality, we're looking at strengthening ourselves, getting experience, but also repairing some damage. And um, adversity experienced as a young child means that you know that, and even though you uh, were thrown into survival through that, um, you're not going to be afraid of those kinds of adversities because you know them. The work is that when you're in survival, your way of handling those adversities corresponds to a character defect. And what you have to do is to shift your response to the adversity from a character defect to a spiritual power. And that is the work. Speaking of work, I think we should go into what is now contained at the bottom of page 30 and 31. Uh, you state the following as an introduction to this. Many of the following strategies for improving personal relationships have emerged through the Brahma Kumari's discoveries and experiments over the past 60 years by applying the knowledge and practice of Raj Yoga and spirituality. These intriguing and effective alternative strategies express spiritual laws. The first one you ask us to consider is um, contained at the bottom of page 30. Number one is consider the mistake of others to be your own. When I read this, I thought, seriously? Uh, the reason is um, most of us are quite sure we've got enough of our own to contend with. And now you're saying, uh, you know, whomsoever is within my sphere, let your mistakes be mine as well. Isn't this adding to your burden and not de deleting from it? Why would somebody do this? You know, this is a strategy mm -hmm. for the purpose of improving personal relationships. Um, you perceive through your subjective filtered eyes and ears that someone is making a mistake and you can justify that in terms of your value system and so on and so forth. That mistake may be quite a small one and your relationship with that person is going to be affected by how you handle your relationship around that mistake. When you have a relationship and you pick on somebody's mistakes, your relationship with that person is going to be adversely affected. If you say, this person's mistake is my mistake, it doesn't mean that you did what they did. But what it does mean is that you're looking at what is your part in the problem. And maybe you say this person did something wrong but from another angle they had a different taste from you and just because it's not your taste it doesn't mean they did something wrong and so you're going to have to compromise and work with that person to not blame that person not hold that person as having made a big mistake and you're the totally innocent one because a lot of the time it's not just black and white like that and both sides have something that they could need to apologize for yeah. but once you start to say to yourself that person's mistake I could just as easily have made that mistake they were in the wrong place at the wrong time or whatever you know so you are being I think a lot more realistic about common mistakes that people make uh, by taking that as a strategy and also um, when you do something like this it means that you put you value the relationship over being nitpicking about niggly things you know mm. Tell me how ego comes into play here. Uh, it must, mustn't it? You see, if somebody makes a mistake, a lot of times it's going to be an ego clash. Their ego against your ego. 
And from a spiritual angle, any ego is ego. So my ego and your ego crash against each other. What's required is a moment of humility. And um, I sometimes refer to Dadi Prakash Mani, who was an incredible leader of the Brahma Kumaris for 40 years. And she used to talk about uh, conceding defeat whenever there was a clash of ego. And what that would do is enable the relationship to continue. You accept that you are wrong, even though the other person is wrong. But you're moving away from an ego clash to a interaction which is much more um, manageable. And when you do that, you function as a mirror. And a mirror is not aggressive. It just stands there and you look in it and then you see something. So when the person concedes defeat and accepts, you know, I made the mistake or your mistake is my mistake, and you place yourself as a mirror, the other person can see their mistake. If you challenge them, confront them, uh, they will never see what's wrong. But when you just become neutral, or you concede defeat, uh, then they see. And that's really what you want. You go on to say in page 31, it is common practice to hide your mistakes and direct attention to the faults of others to avoid the discomfort of admitting your own defects and your inability to face public humiliation. Uh, I want to ask you to expand on the following. This new strategy makes it possible to redirect the strong ego reactions of criticizing others back towards yourself and triggers important realizations about your own character defects. This in turn makes you more sensitive to the feelings and reputation of others and your behavior becomes more humble. Um, when you're doing this, you will receive an enormous amount of resistance from your own ego, won't oh, it? Oh yes, because your ego remains totally invisible. Somebody else's ego is absolutely clear to you. This is the imbalance. And by applying this strategy, you actually cause your ego to become visible to you. And then you have a very different relationship with your ego and the other person's ego. And you realize that this is a matter of the, what is it, the pot calling the kettle black, mm. you know. Mm. And so it is um, uh, very important in a spiritual practice to use any and every little strategy that will cause one's own ego to be visible to oneself. Because your work is not to fix somebody else's ego, your work is to fix your own. A shockingly large percentage of us spend um, a lot of our lives trying to fix other people. Yes, waste of time. Never yeah. works. Yeah, we've got no jurisdiction, do we? Not really. But our real work is to cause our own ego to become visible. And only when it's visible can we strike it. And our job is to strike that thing down and then we have overcome it. So uh, this is very difficult because you're shooting at an invisible target and the other person's ego looks like the target but is not. So you go around shooting the wrong target and then the problem of your own ego just never gets addressed and it keeps getting bigger. I need to ask you, are all of these books designed to shatter one's own ego? Uh, yes. Since we've already started, we might as well take this course to the end. <laughs> uh, you, you could have led with that. Well, there are many things that this course is designed to do. It, shattering one's own ego is not the only thing. It's part of it. What happens in life is you may get people who are really good mentors for you, and they also are good ego destroyers. And they will take pot shots at your ego, and because you um, have a lot of loyalty to them and regard for them, you won't attack them. 
but you will feel that they hurt you because that's the ego reaction. But the end result will be that your ego is coming down. So they're actually quite good friends. And if you look at the second one, uh, this is exactly that. Mm. Yeah, let's go to that, shall we? Those who insult you are your true friends. This is the opposite of what you would in instinctively think. This strategy reverses your instinctive ego reaction against criticism and your desire to hear only compliments and flattery. This technique of those who insult you are your true friends short circuits your reactive ego defense. Um, I'd like you to tell us how do you handle your pain because this hurts you, doesn't it? The thing about spiritual practice is that it does help you to cultivate virtues, but virtues are very delicate things. What you also have to cultivate is powers, and one of the powers is the power to endure, to tolerate, uh, and um, you see criticism and so on hurts. You see, and it hurts your ego. And when your ego is hurting, you who identify with your false ego, you hurt. I am being hurt by this person. And so a person in spiritual practice knows about this. And you have to quickly flag it up and saying, okay, right now what I have to do is tolerate and keep quiet and wait it out uh, because my ego is being shot down I am not being shot down. I am not my ego. My ego is a mask to which I have become fused. And the pain is the instrument that unglues me from my ego mask. And that's a very, very beneficial thing. But you have to take the pain. If the statement is false, you are forced to maintain your dignity and self-respect. If the statement is true, you benefit greatly from accepting straight honest statements instead of arrogantly rejecting them as insults. Either way, you still get hurt, don't you? If you have good power of endurance, you can handle the hurt. And it really depends on your values. You see, values are like prices. Your pain is, say, a $500 pain. Um, your freedom from your ego you may say, okay, well, that's a thousand dollar gain. So if you pay $500 for a thousand dollar thing, you've saved $500. So you have a better deal. When you use these two techniques of considering the mistakes of others to be your own and those who insult you are your true friends, if you apply uh, the spiritual practice that is contained in these pages, what do you become? What do you achieve? And how do you grow? What you become is uh, humble. Um, you become much more aware of your own shortcomings. Uh, your arrogance level comes down. I think you become a lot more solid as a person. And um, when you are a very arrogant person, you're also very fragile. And when you look at it, what do you want? Do you want to be fragile or do you want to be solid? Well, most people would prefer to be solid. And your solidity is intensified by going through all of these things. You know, I remember um, one of the uh, things that my father used to do was research concrete. And what he had to do was check how much stress different forms of concrete could take because then the civil engineering industry would use the one the most stress resistant. And it's a bit like that for us. If we're very arrogant and fragile, we can't take any kind of stress. So an insult is a stress. But if you're solid and strong and you have the power of humility, you can take these blows and it's not going to break you. And that is much more valuable than anything can break you. Because if you're easily broken, your ego is going to try and shore that up and you're going to become devious and maybe go around the corner and attack 
the person who brought to your attention your fragility and your arrogance and you will try to take them down because you don't want to have to face that. And that's um, a weak soul who has decided to remain weak. But I think what you can do is to say, okay, um, uh, uh, I do have weaknesses, but I don't need to keep them. And there are many things I can do to really make myself more solid, more strong, more balanced, more real. And that makes me feel much better about myself than the other, even though it really feels bad. Mm. I don't want it. Okay, that brings us to the close of today's episode. Thank you. Thank you. I suppose at the end of the day, one has to ask oneself, what do you want? Um, if you want to become a spiritually powerful and enlightened individual, then um, you will continue with this journey. And um, if there is anything here that makes you feel uncomfortable, um, you simply ignore it and do what suits you best. But when applying these spiritual principles, one has to know that um, your ego will become crushed in the process and you will become stronger as a result. So thank you, Sister Denise, for the technique shared. Thank you. And thank you today for joining us. And I do hope that we will get to see you soon for the next episode where we will be discussing things like being dispassionate in the face of success and failure, etc. Take care and thank you for joining us. Goodbye.